so excited to be part of this soil health workshop. I just have a quick little story about why I'm so thrilled about it. I ride my bike uh, from Deerfield to Hadley every morning um, to the bread basket of New England, Route 47. And so many of the farm fields there look like they are made of concrete. It's very gray soil. Um, it's very wind blown. There is no tilt. So we have some people here who are going to talk about how we're going to change all of that. Yay. So we're going to start with Keith Zaltzberg. He, as a resilience planner and environmental designer, Keith has dedicated his career to shaping and stewarding human landscapes as a force of regeneration by awakening people's capacity to understand, engage, and manage landscapes as living ecosystems. His current work is first on, focused on accelerating the, adopt, the adoption of nature-based solutions and regenerative agriculture to address climate resilience and equity. Thanks so much, Lori. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to wear this mask because I have a three-month-old and I'm trying to, if you can't hear me, let me know and I will speak up. I look like this. Uh, I'm so glad to be here today. I'm, uh, I've been working in Deerfield and got connected with the Climate Forum through the work of Chris Curtis on a program uh, of resilience and adaptation planning that's being funded by the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness uh, Program. And uh, it's, it funds really exciting work throughout the state. Andrew will be presenting on that after this. Uh, but it's, it's been uh, a pleasure to be in my home region thinking about how we can use agriculture and forests to be part of a, a climate solution that also benefits the human beings and other creatures that live in the area. And, you know, this is part of a project that's happening all over the world. People are trying to race climate change to help farmers adapt. And there are planners, designers, politicians, and policymakers trying to figure out how we can enable mitigation efforts as well to make climate change effects less significant. Um, and over the last several years, in addition to the work I'm doing here in Deerfield, I've had the opportunity to work at the state level with the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs to try to come up with a Massachusetts Healthy Soils Action Plan. And we're hoping that it comes out uh, this year. It's kind of being reviewed by all the different executive agencies right now. Um, but my team got to lead a group of over 40 scientists, academics, researchers, amazing folks from like the American Farmland Trust and the Nature Conservancy in trying to understand what are the contributing factors that lead to healthy soils on all land types, not just agriculture, across the state of Massachusetts, and what can we do to influence the way lands are managed and developed over time. And together, you know, the effect they were going for was ways to improve all the policies and programs, especially those related to climate resilience work, uh, to consider soils. And then use soils understanding to guide new land use planning and, and protection efforts. Uh, and supporting land managers was one of the key outcomes that they were looking for as well and identifying where there are gaps in research and funding that can actually help all of these people change their practice. And um, at the state level, we identified these key seven strategies, uh, mainly focusing on keeping healthy soils healthy by keeping the living plants and other life that live in that soil growing and adapting. There's the, a, a more limited, effort to enhance and restore already degraded soils. Um, one of, in Massachusetts in particular, one of the key things that we need to do is direct development, you know, conversion of land from one type to another better to protect really healthy soils, which I'll talk more about in a little while, and make sure that uh, we account for carbon in all of our land use decisions. So that's one of the things that's being done right now as part of the decarbonization <laughs> roadmap, uh, which is part of the Global Warming Solutions Act that is, is moving in the state that you've probably heard about several times today already. Um, but when we align all these efforts and actually start testing what's going on, there's some real benefit that we can do. Um, by implementing better soil practices, we can, 
we can probably sequester almost half a million tons of additional carbon on an annual basis, which is 3.3% of the gap between, you know, decarbonizing the fuel stocks of Massachusetts and making all the energy grid improvements. There's still a gap of, you know, 15% to get down to no net. So land-based solutions can fill up another three plus percent of that, but it means that we need to change the way we're managing our soils and thinking about our soils. So what are healthy soils? They have a, there are a lot of different definitions, but essentially the UMass Center for Agriculture and Food and the Environment has this really nice summary that says, you know, healthy soils are living ecosystems that support the evolving diversity of the natural and human activities in our world. And to keep soils healthy means that there's going to be variation because there's many different types of soils, but there's sort of these five essential functions that healthy soils produce or supply. And you know, the top two are the things that we can sort of see and sense on a, with our eyes and on a daily basis. It's the actual productivity of the soils. You know, how does this patch of soil grow a crop or grow a tree compared to that patch of soil or compared to itself under different management? Part of that's driven by the biological activity and diversity that's living in that soil. And some of that is, is driven by these more invisible factors, like how well does this soil catch and hold water and then make that available to plants? Same with nutrients. And all of that is really driven by the fifth key function, which is how does that soil capture and hold soil carbon? Because all soils, you know, whether they're really sandy, dry soils or clay soils, have a variation in how they might be able to perform. But the soil carbon content is really the thing that s says, is this unique soil operating at its greatest health or at a lower state of health? Just like we all have sort of a range, you know, not all of us are Olympians, but all of us can be healthy and active. And um, the soil carbon is what really helps define that. And in Massachusetts, if we're talking about croplands, Soils typically have somewhere between one and two percent soil organic carbon, um, excuse me, soil organic matter, which is about 60 percent soil organic carbon. So soil organic matter is the sort of crumbly humus that you can see in your soil. And the soil organic carbon is the actual like chemical component that's actually made up of carbon. So most Massachusetts soils that are in crops have one to two percent soil organic matter. But, you know, Rattan Lal, a world class soil scientist and agronomist who is on all the international panels for climate change says optimally we have somewhere between three and five percent soil organic matter in our soils to make sure that they're performing at their best so how do we go from that one to two percent to the three to five percent well regenerative farming practices the practices that Dan and Kate will talk about today are some of the ways that we can get that. And I'll cover that kind of in the broadest brush. But how does that connect to climate change in general um, is a big question. So I'm going to move through a lot of material quickly. Um, these PowerPoint can be made available if anybody wants it. My speaker notes are in there so you can kind of reference things. But this graphic is representing how carbon moves through the global ecosystem as um, shown by Project Drawdown, which is an amazing resource. If you haven't seen it yet, they did this massive meta-analysis of data from all these different sectors to understand what are the most 100 most significant climate solutions that we can develop. And um, part of that was helping people understand the dynamics of that. And they, they looked at these different sectors <clears throat> And essentially, you know, there are two main ways that we reduce the atmospheric climate challenge of having too much carbon-based stuff in the atmosphere. And one is by slowing and reducing the amount of emissions that we have, the sources of, of carbon. Um, about 25 or 24% of all of the emissions that happen are coming from the way we manage food production and agricultural lands. And all of that's going up to the atmosphere. Some of that remains in the atmosphere, and some of it gets vacuumed up by the ocean 
and by these land-based carbon sinks is what we call them. So the other way that we can ad address this is by accelerating and increasing and protecting the sequestration capacity, how well trees and other plants are able to vacuum carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it into their bodies and into their roots and out into the soils. And how well can it store carbon long term in what are they called stocks or pools? And so that's what we're trying to do to try to reduce this by increasing this and reducing the, the current sources. Um, there are many basic regenerative ag practices that can help contribute to that. And um, I'm trying to find my little mouse so I can, oh well, um, that's fine. So there are many basic ones and we'll talk about some of these today. Um, but first, I wanna talk about where carbon lives in Massachusetts. So through the Healthy Soils Action Plan, we were able to do a deep dive into these amazing repositories of research that have been done by the Natural Resource Conservation Soils Science uh, over the last hundred years and by other researchers. Oh yeah, five minutes, great. Um, so where does soil carbon live in Massachusetts? We found that you know, it, it lives in different intensities, different concentrations in the, each of the different soil types. Um, <clears throat> but in total, we have almost 400 million metric tons of soil organic carbon in the soils of Massachusetts. That doesn't include biomass or anything like that. And if you look at the valley itself, you can see that there are a lot, there's a lot of variation. You know, the lighter yellow colors are, are less uh, carbon rich and the darkest brown colors are the most carbon rich. And this has to do with uh, land cover, land use, and the land use history of soils, in addition to the, just the intrinsic characteristics of the soils themselves. So a sandy soil is always gonna hold less carbon potential than a more clay soil, just because of the way the physical and chemical properties work. But land management and land cover, meaning how we manage what's happening, and what, whether it's forest or pasture, a garden or a cultivated field, really determines how much carbon is in a soil. And if we zoom into Deerfield, um, just as a for example, we can see that the whole region is actually generally higher in soil carbon than many other places in Massachusetts. And that's sort of a result of the, the good fortune that the glaciers brought us and, and the rivers and, and all the other biological factors that have enriched the soil over time. Um, but you can see some patterns here. The hillsides tend to be more carbon rich than the valley bottoms with the exception of these little sinuous gaps here. What do you think those are? Like if you had to guess, you know, from a land cover perspective, what's going on right here and here and here to make that soil so rich in carbon? Wetlands, that's right. So wetlands, because of their unique chemical properties, um, actually hold more soil carbon than any other land cover type. So we can see that there's some relationship between land cover and the soil carbon. And so when we think about Deerfield as districts, we have these forested hillsides. From a soil health perspective, it's really about protecting and enhancing the adaptation of the forest to climate change. And then we have this cultivated and developed valley, uh, you know, kind of on both, both rivers. And so if we look at this land cover and then think about soil carbon and where it lives within these land covers, we can see, you know, the average agricultural field, that includes pasture and cultivated holds around 50 tons of soil carbon per acre. Whereas, you know, a wetland holds 115 and forests hold twice what cultivated land. So the gap between this and this is really what our regenerative soil potential is. Because forests for upland soils are really the best we can do in terms of soil carbon content. And you know the soil carbon content will affect how much water is held in those soils, how much nutrient is held in those soils, and how well they can respond to things like drought and disturbance. So really, as we think about you know, activities 
that are going to improve soils, we want to try to close the gap by improving the soil carbon content toward forests. Um, two minutes, great. So, you know, right now in Deerfield, like many places in Massachusetts, there are three main categories of threats to existing soil health and the soil, sequest uh, soil carbon sequestration potential. And those are climate change. And you know, this, anybody know what's going on in this picture here? Mouth of the Connecticut, Mouth of the Connecticut Long Island Sound. What is this? This is, a, this is a soil plume from Hurricane Irene, some of which came right from here, you know? Um, so that's right. And once that's gone, you know, that's never coming back. Um, takes a long time for that soil to form. So protecting against, you know, mass wasting events and erosion through the more frequent and intense flooding and other storms we're having, the longer droughts and potentially the future forest fires that we're gonna have is some of the climate change stuff. And then we have indirect threats like, change in, in development and migration patterns. Like people who live in more disturbed areas like the Southwest are gonna be maybe looking to the Northeast and saying, that looks pretty nice up there. Um, so if we're gonna to try to accept more people, how do we do it in a way that doesn't result in the second big threat, which is fragmentation and habitat conversion from forest and farmland to developed landscapes. Um, that's the, the biggest, you know, we, we expect based on some projections that we've done, that there could be almost a doubling of the amount of developed land in Deerfield above what it is today by 2050. So planning and uh, intentional development of that development pattern is really important. And we can use soils to help understand that. I'll just, can I take one or two more minutes? Cool. Um, and then land management is another, another key piece but it has, it's more dynamic, you know, as you change the way you manage your fields, you improve them slowly over time. And then if you till them, that soil carbon gets released again. So um, it's not permanent change like you might have here and here, but it's very important. And because these are more high frequency managed sites, there's less of a barrier to changing that. You know, it could be easier to convince someone to change their practice versus not sell their land um, for development. So using the funding through this MVP project, we were able to, my colleague, Eric Giordano, and I um, worked to develop a set of soil conservation and regeneration analyses and come up with some uh, recommendations on how to manage these. So, you know, from the highest conservation soils are those that already store or sequester a lot of carbon. So this is really about land protection and, help, and um, facilitation of adaptation. So helping forests adapt to the changing climate. You have these lower soil conservation potential. These are places that are already either low in carbon or degraded. And these are places where we might consider doing like infill development to lessen the soil impact of future development. Um, then we have this, the moderate is really it has moderate stocks of soil organic carbon and a moderate potential to store more. So it's places where we can like on the everyday try to make it a little bit better. But um, one of the things that's really interesting about Deerfield in particular is the overlap between the high soil regeneration value and the agricultural land that's here. So these lands have the potential to hold a lot more carbon than they do, almost twice as much as they currently do if we think about that forest potential. And how can we shape our agricultural practice to help these soils kind of be their best. And we can see, you know, this is the high regeneration value soils. Here's the active farmland. And then there's the overlap. And you can see, you know, almost three quarters of that uh, active, uh, th that uh, active farmland with regener high regeneration value is the total farmland. So regenerative agriculture, or what we might call soil smart agriculture, is one way that we can help with that. And there are several essential practices. This includes like basic things like reducing the tillage frequency and depth, um, diversifying crop rotations, retaining more of the biomass and putting more biomass onto the site, um, and introducing perennials and other deep rooted plants that are gonna help hold and pump soil carbon into the, into the dirt. And then um, there's, you know, in grazing situations, 
more highly managed grazing situations. And um, Kate and Dan will talk more about the details of one of the key no-till, uh, one of the key regenerative practices, which is no-till agriculture. But there's some basic things like applying compost to hay fields that can really help improve the carbon dynamics. Um, just mowing your fields a little bit higher. If you mow them, you know, a lot of people mow at about two inches. If you double that to four inches, you don't lose that much biomass, but it helps the grass recover a lot more quickly and keeps a lot of roots from shedding. And so you actually have much better uh, forage and or sort of fodder and uh, soil quality. Introducing additional species into your soil crop uh, cover crops and using soil cover crops is, is key. And then you have these no-till production methods, which I'm not going to talk about at all. And then lower till production methods like strip tilling. And I'll end just by saying, you know, if we look at the five, the four top crops that Eric was able to pull out of a, a great database called Cropscapes, you can see that, you know, we have almost 3,000 or 2,800 acres of uh, actively managed cropland. That's tilled land in the Deerfield area uh, or, or hay. And, um, you know, these four different regenerative practices are either applicable or experimentally applicable here. Uh, and, you know, if we were to take the total acreage of almost 4,000 acres and increase the soil organic matter by just 1%, we could, we could store more than 75 million additional gallons of water. So that's a, when we're looking at a hotter but drier, a uh, wetter but drier environment that we're coming into, where we're going to have big pulses of rain followed by longer droughts, which we've all been experiencing like every May for the last few years. This store, soil water storage could be the, the difference between your crop failing and it, and it thriving. So that's why we want to uh, try to increase soil health for our farmers. So I'll, pa I'll stop there and um, questions at the end. Yeah, thanks so much, Lori. Uh, usually, I begin with a sling, uh, with a slide of uh, a farmer disking a field and big clouds of dust behind him. But I'm really trying to concentrate more on some positive messages. So I'd like to start my no-till presentation with a picture of a mushroom, just because it is the soil fungi that takes such a hard hit whenever the soil is tilled. In the early days of American agriculture, plowing was called breaking ground, and in the 400 years since the first gardens were planted by European immigrants, an awful lot of ground has been broken. I cannot tell you the name of this fantastic looking mushroom fruiting body, but I can tell you that what you see here represents just a tiny fraction of the whole organism, perhaps as little as one ten thousandth of its total weight. The vast majority of this fungus consists of its hair-like roots or mycelium whose vital function is to act as symbiotic transporters of essential nutrients directly to the roots of our crops. If you look at the soil surrounding this mushroom, you can see abundant aggregates or clumps that are good indicators of high humus content. These clumps of soil allow water and air to penetrate deeply into the ground, preventing runoff and erosion. And now, right, will this give me a new one? One of my favorite demonstrations when giving a tour on a Starte farm is to pull up a weed, and believe me, no-till farming doesn't mean no weeds, and show off the depth of the roots and the amount of soil aggregates that cling to them. This is where the plant root hairs and the mushroom mycelia engage in that vital exchange of nutrients. One of our goals is to keep living roots in the soil consistently, which means those transactions continuously take place. Plants take full advantage of the enzymatic activity of the fungi that transforms soil minerals into available, soluble form. In return, the plants give up some of the carbon they've absorbed from the atmosphere. Fungi can sequester huge amounts of carbon in our soils, even by some calculations enough to solve our existing atmospheric carbon problem. I'm sure we all know if we don't cut it down, we ain't going to solve anything. Another important function of the mycelium is their ability to hold water. 
For plant roots, it's much like having a big sponge in the soil. In times of drought, there is a source of moisture directly attached to them. And in times of a deluge, there's a structure in place to absorb excess water. So just take a moment and consider the trees in the forest. The incredible amount of growth grows from undisturbed soil, fallen leaves, and natural rainfoil. The largest organism on Earth so far discovered is a single honey fungus that measures almost two and a half square miles located in the Blue Mountains of Oregon. Recent research indicates that trees may be using these same fungal networks to communicate with each other and communicate pest threats and relegate nutrient supplies to other trees in their immediate vicinity. You may be looking at the original internet. I'm going to show a few slides with market garden size equipment in them, but please remember that most of it can be scaled up or down to fit either farm sized operations or home gardens. This shot shows our tractor flail mowing a spring, gone, spring sown cover crop of oats and peas with the center bed having been mown a few weeks earlier and the bed in the foreground showing a vibrant mix of lettuces. Flail mowers are now available as attachments for garden sized tillers like the blue BCS brand and are an excellent use for those tools that are all too often destructive in our backyard soils. A flail mower has a horizontal drum with pivoting knives that chop the cover crop and drops it all in one place. The flail mower keeps all the cut material on the bed top, making a uniform layer of fresh green mulch that's easy to transplant into. Lawn tractors with mulching kits can approximate the same result and often leave the green material more finely chopped due to the speed of those rotary blades. One of our favorite techniques for bed prep is to use what we call occultation strips. Weed mat or woven ground cover is available in a variety of lengths and widths. The tight weave allows air and water to penetrate while totally blocking out any light and preventing weed seed germination. The moist darkness under the strips hastens the breakdown of crop residues and can even be used to terminate low growing cover crops. That function is particularly handy in our unheated high tunnels, where it is impractical to maneuver a flail mower or a roller crimper. It is helpful if there's irrigation available to kickstart the breakdown of the terminated crop, or if the residue is already dried and stalky, some additional compost can speed up the operation. Of course, not everything works just as we've planned, and these springtime winds can play havoc with the strips. Here's a technique that's falling out of favor on the farm, but can be really useful around the yard or when you want to open up new ground for planting. A few years ago, we found a good source of corrugated cardboard with no colored ink on it, and thus allowed for use on a certified organic operation. It is an admittedly labor-intensive project to strip off any plastic packing tape and overlap the sheets with no gaps between them. We've also begun to reduce the path widths on the farm. And instead of using the bucket on the tractor to spread the chips, we now have to wheelbarrow them out onto the cardboard. The corrugated cardboard seems to kick off the fungal decomposition of the chips. And while we get good single season weed control, we've not been satisfied with the results in season two. There have been concerns in the past about using wood chips as mulch due to the fact that they require nitrogen to break down. But in our experience, as long as the chips were left on the surface of the soil, this hasn't been an issue. That can become a problem if they're incorporated into the soil. Considerable success has been shown when using this technique to establish gardens in an old lawn or sod situations. Fluid shapes can be achieved for flower borders or more formal spaces can be laid out for shrub establishment. How am I doing on time?
I'll read. Speak up a little bit. I'll try to sit up better. We began using silage tarps last year for any larger spots in the field where we wanted a complete fresh start. They are made of very heavy plastic and are black on one side and white on the other. During the growing season when the sun is high and hot, they can do a good job of cleaning up an area in as few as three weeks. Despite a lot of enthusiasm in the organic no-till community for the use of tarps, I'm not a big fan of this technique for several reasons. In my opinion, we already are using too much plastic on the farm, from drip tape to propagation flats, from greenhouse films to the small bags we use to package greens. I also don't trust the effects of these impermeable tarps on our soil structure and wonder how much beneficial soil life gets smothered while the weeds are brought under control. On the bright side, that same impermeable quality can hold moisture in the soil for a long time. This tarp was used for almost five months over the winter and with sharp eyes you can see that the eggplant stalks to the left of the metal posts are all soft and decaying, while to the right, the stalks that were left exposed are still erect and woody. More in line with the basic no-till philosophy of keeping living roots in the soil as long as possible, we've had pretty good luck using a roller crimper to terminate cover crops. By mounting the roller on the tractor front forks, very precise control of the down pressure can be maintained. When properly used, the veins welded to the roller crimp and sometimes even cut the standing cover crop and leave a pre-mulched bed ready to plant into. The downside of this tool is that if you, it takes really careful, let me try that again. The downside of this tool is that it takes careful timing to crimp a grain at the appropriate time. When you use it on a cover that is too early and soft, it can stand back up. If you use it too late on grain with viable seed heads and you can end up replanting the grain where your crop is supposed to be growing. Home gardeners have been known to use a two by four with a rope tied to each end to crimp cover crops in their own home gardens. One of the best tools for our size operation has been a hydraulically driven compost drop spreader. By varying the engine speed which drives the hydraulic motor, we can drop from a half inch to two inch of sifted compost onto our bed tops. This works well when it's at its lightest setting to cover surface sown seeds like oats and peas, or at deeper settings can provide a compost mulch bed top for setting out vegetable transplants. Unfortunately, this particular unit has been discontinued by the manufacturer but I have seen regular manure spreaders that were modified with shrouding to create the same event, the same effect. And of course at home, it's the wheelbarrow and the shovel. I don't think I hit the button, let me try that. I'm sorry if I'm behind on my slides. Pollinator and insect predator habitat establishment has been a major component of our no-till, no-spray operation. In addition to providing habitat for these beneficial insects, many of these same plants are perennial or self-sowing and provide good, stable conditions for fungal life in the soils. The small yellow flowers in front of this bed are partridge pea, which are often regarded as weeds. Being in the legume family, they contribute free nitrogen into the soil and they possess extra floral nectaries where each branching leaf provides a small pool of plant nectar for predatory wasps. And that's a darn useful weed. <laughs> this presentation only scratches the surface of what we're trying to do on a Starte farm. Companion planting, perennial cover crops, passive soil preparation are just a few of the additional techniques we're pursuing. The classic question that we get is whether our techniques can be scaled up to a 300 acre commercial operation. The roller crimpers, the flail mowers, the no-till mechanized planters and cedars are all 
available today to equip farms of that size. But quite frankly, here in New England, I would rather see 60 five-acre farms employing three people each than one 300-acre farm run by four people with massive debt financing. Smaller, less expensive equipment run by smaller house power, horsepower, less expensive tractors could provide hundreds of jobs for those who want to lurk the, work the land. And I can't read my own writing. <laughs> that be the end of the presentation. Time for questions? Or at the end? At the end. Well, we have two more minutes in your time, so if you want to have any questions. Yes, sir. My view of lawns, um, largely a, a waste of space. Uh, we, still, we still have a lot of lawn around our house, but with cardboard, the perennial beds are getting bigger and bigger, and uh, it's just a place to rake, which I don't enjoy. I'd love to have the leaves sit there and decompose fungally. Yes? Have you been able to apply these techniques on your entire 300 acres? On my entire 300 acres? I have not done a 300-acre farm in a very long time. When we did the 1,000 acres in Tennessee, it was chemicals, loans from the bank, the biggest tractors we could afford, and we literally uh, drove that farm right into the ground. How big is your farm? Uh, this is uh, 6.6 .6 acres, but with house, barns, mandatory organic buffer zones, we're growing on about three and a half acres. So we do three and a half acres with two co-managers and four part-time employees. Uh, what was the name of the weed that you just talked about in the last slide? Um, partridge pea. Yeah, it's sometimes known as a weed, but uh, it's really a lovely plant. Yellow. Yeah, yeah little yellow flowers and uh, it self-seeds freely, which is why it's known as a weed, I'm afraid. It, it was also looked in that elevator, uh, it looked like Queen Anne's lace, is that on there? We left, we leave the Queen Anne's lace anywhere except where we're growing carrots, yes. Yes. Uh, I'm not giving advice for it's just like a small garden bed that's totally invaded with invasive, like crabgrass and everything. And oh, we have a lot of fun with crabgrass. Well, a lot of our grasses are really, really fun. I would try a piece of that landscape fabric, and if you can, if you can pin it down along the edges really tight, uh, you may have some luck. You can even cut little holes in it and put transplants in there, and then after the season's up, pull it up and see what the, see what the grass looks like then. Okay. So we hopefully will have more time for questions at the end. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so as you've probably already heard this morning, maybe in an introductory um, session and probably no news to everyone, we're gonna have higher temperatures, um, so greater drought stress, higher precipitation in the winter and spring, resulting in more erosion, uh, lots of soil organic matter, nutrients, difficulty getting crops planted, and increase in the number of those heavy precipitation events, which we know are devastating when we have bare soil, um, as well as, uh, wreck havoc on disease for our vegetable crops and ponding and flooding and getting things harvested. So not great news. Um, just kind of some pictures. My agency was the Soil Conservation Service originally, founded out of the Dust Bowl. So we've been fighting erosion and unfortunately we're still fighting erosion. But <laughs> And we were promoting soil health back in the 80s and that kind of went by the wayside and now we're back at it. Um, but hoping soil health will help address uh, these uh, issues. So uh, Keith spoke a, a bit about it, briefly the general characteristics of cultivated soil, um, less water infiltration and storage, less biological activity, biological diversity, uh, less efficient nutrient cycling, higher summer temperatures with that bare soil. Um, sometimes getting less vigor with our crops. Obviously the erosion is an obvious one and uh, decreased aggregation and 
both these guys uh, spoke about aggregation. I got a couple slides here. I shortened this part of my presentation up, but with farmers, I really try to teach them uh, like how soil health works and how we improve our soils, like kind of the science of it, because it was sort of news to me even after four years of college at a agricultural school. <laughs> so we get that, that sun and, you know, sequestering carbon dioxide in those plants um, exude carbon out of their roots. You know, that's a symbiotic two-way street feeding the microbes um, and the soil life. And then the soil life is feeding that plant back. Um, and then through all of their metabolism and their uh, activity, creating enzymes and polysaccharides and glomalin from the mycorrhizal fungi, creating these sticky uh, these, these sticky substances that they produce to form soil aggregates. And that is an awesome, amazing thing. Like when you pull up that weed, it's, it's so telling uh, to a farmer or just anyone. Um, so that we can ideally, once we in, keep those uh, aggregates intact and not break them up with our, our tillage equipment, we can allow the soil structure to develop uh, deep and with roots and earthworm channels and uh, cover on the surface. So um, just an image out of a textbook here with uh, high organic matter soil. So again, it's that organic matter that helps the soil aggregate the organic matter from the microbes and um, from plant root exudates in general. So that's going to have an aggregated soil, which is going to infiltrate water, where the aggregates, the soil pieces, peds that uh, don't have as much organic matter, they aren't as stable or strong. So once the rain hits them, especially if they're bare, they're going to disperse and it's going to create a silt over the top. And that's why we don't get water infiltration. We get runoff instead. So uh, just uh, kind of showing some beakers here with a uh, low organic matter soil on the one side and a high organic matter on the next. When you fill them with water, the aggregates dis broke apart and dispersed on the low organic matter soil, just demonstrating the same thing. Uh, we're going to get all these intense rain events, and they're unfortunately not going to infiltrate <laughs> uh, as readily if we have poor organic matter. So this was 25 years of conventional corn. The other one was five years of corn, but with a, uh, had been in 20 years of grass before that. So. So NRCS has been promoting uh, kind of four principles that support uh, well-aggregated, high-functioning, resilient, high-organic matter soils, and, and Keith spoke to them. So minimize disturbance, maximize soil cover. Those are kind of like going to protect our soil um, by not slicing and dicing those aggregates, protecting the surface uh, from the high temperatures in the summer and the rain events on the soil. And then the, the third and fourth, maximize continuous living roots and maximizing biodiversity. Those are feeding the soil by that continuous supply of carbon getting emitted through uh, the roots year round, not just you know, while we're growing our cash crop. And then biodiversity. Uh, they say that the more diversity you have above ground translates to greater diversity below ground. So if we're just growing uh, cereal rye, for a winter cover in tomato, uh, sweet corn in the uh, every year in the summer, you know, that's just kind of a narrow focused biological life underground. So we want to have a diversity of species um, kind of in space and in time. So Keith gave a really great introduction of like the acreage of uh, agricultural land in the state and the in Deerfield here. And I pulled these numbers off of this ag census. We have 16,000 acres of corn silage and corn grain in the state, 18,000 acres of vegetables, uh, about 5,000 of sweet corn, lesser of pumpkins and winter squash. And we have, you know, almost well, 79,000 of hay. So, we have what we have, so we do have those 16,000 acres of corn silage. You know, it's, it's here, so we want to try to improve the practices on that corn land as much as we can. Um, and we have some opportunities with the other, some of these other vegetables. And if we could get more into hay, that would be great, because that's the kind of the Cadillac system with that perennial vegetation. Uh, so no-till or reduced tillage system. So I'll speak about the large seeded crops here first. Um, so the first part of my presentation is kind of larger, larger acreage 
agriculture. So it always starts the previous fall with a cover crop, you know, most important part, um, one of the principles, living roots. So we don't ever want to do no-till without a cover crop, ideally, you know, because that's how we're going to get new, new carbon into the soil. So this is just showing a, a farmer planting, and, and a lot of farmers in the area are, are taking, uh, working on these practices, so that's the good news. But if you can get your cover crop planted the day you're still chopping your corn, that's the, the best system. And, and people are doing it now with no-till as well. So the state has funded a lot of these um, drills that you see where you can go right into the residue that's there and put that seed in without having to harrow the soil. Uh, one of my favorite mixes for people that can plant in early September would be uh, wheat, crimson clover, and radish. So you get a nitrogen fixing with the legume. The radish has a tap root, and wheat is a good fibrous root. Wheat doesn't get as tall. Uh, there's reasons to go with that or cereal rye. But once you get later on, you've got to drop the radish out. You know, that's best early. Um, and then even later, we're just, we are talking about monocultures of cereal rye. But any cover crop is really going to be better than none. So that, you know, this gets to our diversity. If we can add multiple species, let, let's do it. So then uh, in the next spring, the corn is planted directly into the cover crop. Uh, the cover crop must be terminated uh, with a herbicide. I'll talk about the non-herbicide option after, um, but you can't just leave it growing. You know, it'd be, Dan knows that with his own vegetables here. You can't have your cover crop growing right in and amongst your uh, cash crop or it's gonna suffer. So they've got planters that are adapted for no-till that can get through that, you know, green, uh, through the vegetation. <laughs> you know, we're used to bare soil, farmers are, so. Um, so you look at all the biomass here on the left, it's microbial and earthworm food. At the end of the summer, you get all this ag aggregation here on the soil surface from the earthworms um, and the bacterial and, and fungi that are living under the residue. That's a picture of some, naturally some corn and some direct seeded squash that were planted with no-till. This was uh, kind of the first guy that I talked into no-till in 2016. And that year it was a, a really bad drought. And I kind of went to the worst spots of uh, the tilled land in the worst spots of the no-till. And the, it was night and day really with the amount of drought stress that was on the tilled land where he still did do some, some tillage. So that, that residue on the surface is really keeping the water from uh, evaporating and reducing evapotranspiration as well. This is on my own farm last year, which I had a really rough year. I thought I was gonna be smart and plant some rye so I could have more biomass, more carbon in my soils. Previously, I had done wheat. Wheat's a lot shorter. You don't have as much carbon going to the soil. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I, I am going to get all academic on this. Well, my 10 pounds a acre of rye ended up looking like 100 <laughs> when I planted. And of course, things always get late by the stuff time things dry out. So this is what you're, I mean, this isn't a $500,000 tractor, you see. <laughs> um, you're, you're driving through this tall, uh, tall cover crop, but in the, you know, you're, you're, pretty scared. But anyways, it, it's such a pleasure planting like this compared to in tilled soil when you have dust and you have to get over off and move rocks. And uh, so I really enjoy no-till planting despite it scaring the out of me sometimes. And then going back in the summer and seeing that aggregation. So this is the no-till or the, the no herbicide option. Uh, I'd say option. <laughs> um, forget my word but anyways so most farmers are planting in early May early to mid-May to do it without a herbicide you have to plant at the end of May even into potentially like early June to be sure that you're not gonna that you're gonna kill that cover crop but um, so the cover the rye needs to be full pollination and even past that slightly forming dose stage they're now saying to really kill that consistently um, so here's a guy that did do this for a year, first year with success, and really it went downhill from there because it's not something you want to do every year. Killed, terminate in the front with the roller crimper, ran behind with his uh, planter. You see it was the uh, planter needs to be set up to slice through a mat like this thick. Uh, here we are helping him make sure the seed's getting in the ground. You got to make adjustments. Uh, the corn did emerge through. 
Uh, he had to roll it twice. He had two species in there, and, and really, like I said, it needs to be early dose stage. It was really too early, so he had to roll it twice. Um, but that year it worked out okay. Um, you know, it, it did die a couple rollings, and he was happy. Um, but here it didn't die, and you can see, you know, there the corn uh, suffered more where it maybe had died on the left. So. Uh, and, and if you got hairy vetch in there, that's even harder to kill. You got to plant that towards the end of June or mid June, third week of June, to be able to kill that. Um, so really, Cornell's done Cornell and uh, Wisconsin. They're doing research on corn. They're really not recommending no-till, no herbicide corn without uh, herbicide. They're recommending for soybeans. That's a little more forgiving of a crop. Uh, lower population is okay with soybeans, but. Um, so then there is zone till, um, strip tillage is kind of, sometimes farmers with no-tills, ah, the soil takes longer to, to warm up. My soil's compacted. So this is kind of, you can see, it's like a hybrid. You're preserving the soil in between and you're making these till channels uh, where the plant is going to be planted, the crop's planted. So this has been successful. I'd say more farmers are actually trying no-till around here than they are uh, the strip till. but. Um, you can do strip till and run a regular planter through it, or, um, yeah. So some people are doing it with pumpkins or winter squash quite a bit. Actually, down the eastern part of the state, there's a guy that's been successful with that direct seeding. Um, so you could do zone till, strip till, and then run a conventional transplanter through that to put transplants. Uh, you know, you're still going to have to terminate that cover crop. With the herbicide, if you're on that early side, there is the option of roller crimping if you're at the right time, you know, when it's early dough. Um, and again, if you don't kill it, you're kind of like, I got my broccoli out there, my tomatoes, and my cover crops growing. Now what do I do? So these are kind of scary things that farmers are faced with. And, and that's why no-till on a larger scale can be, pretty, can be tricky uh, without uh, the use of herbicides. But, I mean, people are persistent in trying things. Uh, the establishment's a little tricky to get through the residue, nitrogen tie-up, and weed control. Uh, this is a guy, up, they've got a weed wiper that you could use for weed control in between. Naturally, on a small enough scale, you could put tarps down in between if the cover crop didn't die or if, if you're getting weed escapes. Because, again, to keep the weeds down for the whole summer, you would need a they say like 8,000 pounds of the dry matter of, um, her, of cover crops. So either putting weed map down, which I'm not a huge fan of, like the whole field being covered with tarps in between, but temporarily you could kill it. Then this is a new system, and there's a guy who was going to speak from Simple Gifts, and Amherst is trying this transferred mulch. So have like maybe a, a, a third or half of your acreage in perennial vegetation um, that you harvest, so it's still sending carbon down year round, but you harvest that material and you bring it over here to your, uh, where you're growing your crops so that you get enough mulch to keep the weeds down in between the roads and in the rows. And then, so they're gonna be putting this, trans this mulch down there on their beds and then they adapted their water wheel transplanter with a longer spike, which still having issues, but it's because you still gotta get through that material, but so. Basically, well, I think they've got some plants established there. Uh, and small scale, Dan covered pretty well. So, but like I said, uh, when, when my personally, the the other option to this no-till systems I described is uh, a lot of plowing and disking and then cultivation. So I don't, I don't. That's not going to sequester much carbon. Um, and, you know, this is kind of what we're looking for. That, that tilled system has got the plow pan there on the bottom and just going to run off. And, and we do have financial assistance available for farmers to do test plots on their farms for no-till and cover crops and other kind of technical assistance and even payments to help them uh, adapt some of these practices. I didn't talk about manure and compost, but we certainly promote that as well. <laughs> lot to learn here. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Kate.